that time. Good morning, church. I tell you, baptism, there's no better way to start a worship service. Amen? Amen. So glad to see you guys here this morning. Today we have two people that we're going to baptize, and they're going to pass into these baptismal waters. I want you to notice what's on the screen, because this is what it's all about. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. And our first lovely person this morning is Caitlin Rogerson, and you all know Caitlin. Caitlin, yeah, give her a hand. She's so excited. She's fired up. If you don't know Caitlin, she comes from awesome, awesome stock. We know with, with uh, her parents and grandparents, there is no, no uh, excuse. This is why you see this godly heritage passed on. And Caitlin, we are so proud of you, proud of your whole family, and your decision to continue to make your faith public by following Christ. So today, it is my privilege and an honor as your pastor, as your friend, to baptize you, my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. She's excited. She almost baptized herself. Let's do this. <laughs> and me too, I like it. This next candidate, Brother Phil. Come on in, Phil. Alright. This is another person who needs no introduction in our church. One of the first times I met Phil, he scared me. We were filming a scene out at his house, and we hadn't known each other long, and I really didn't know what to expect, but within seconds, he became the first man to have ever put me in a headlock and simultaneously kissed my bald head. And uh, I appreciate that, and today is a special day, not just because it's the first time I've ever been able to say there is 500 pounds of man in this hot tub right now, <laughs> between the two of us. Because Phil is an awesome guy, and I admire his faith, and his whole family comes from, I mean, it's just a godly heritage, and we see that, and we see that passed down with kids and grandkids coming to know Christ, and there's nothing more exciting than that. So, Phil, it's an honor, brother. I love you. I'm so proud of you. And today, in front of all these witnesses, it is my privilege to baptize you, my brother in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you stand together as we begin our, our time of prayer? We prepare our hearts. We've already been worshiping Jesus. But let's bow together as we continue. Father, we are just overflowing with joy. I thank you for these that have made decisions to follow you and to publicly profess you as Lord and Savior. God, you are so good to us. We know that you are here already. We know the angels rejoice. Father, as we begin to turn our hearts to you and worship you, I pray that it would be pleasing in your sight today. We love you. We give you this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, church. Good to see you. You made it through all five episodes of this series, Created for Significance. And I hope you just realize what we sang. Because we're going to talk about a very gripping, very short story today that talks about two people. One who built their life on Christ and one who built his life on himself. And they had drastically different results. We are finishing up three chapters of Luke that are so powerful, so intense, some of the most powerful parables in all of the Gospels. And Jesus is very serious with these, and he changes his audience. Today we're going to deal with a story that's kind of profound and honestly a little creepy because it deals with the reality of the afterlife, and it gives us just a glimpse of heaven and hell. And it reminds me of that great story that you've probably heard a hundred times, but I love it, that sweet little girl is wrapping up her favorite book report presentation on a story of her choice, and she chose the presentation of Jonah and the whale, or Jonah and the great fish, to be more biblically accurate. And as she was finishing up this public uh, book report presentation, the teacher was cranky, and she looked at her with a disapproving, condescending nod and said, you don't really believe all that, do you? And the little girl was shocked, and she said, yes, ma'am, I absolutely do. And the teacher continued to mock her beliefs, 
with dripping condescension says, you can't be serious. Stories like that are myth. They're legend. You know that, right? I mean, how in the world could Jonah ever survive something like that? And the little girl looked at her and said, well, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. <laughs> and the teacher very flippantly, without missing a beat, says, well, what if he goes to hell? And then she said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. It's, it's kind of funny when you see the innocence of a child, but it's also very sobering, two different neighborhoods. And it always bothers me when people say, accept Christ and you will have eternal life. Because that's only half the story. Because even if you don't accept Christ, the way I read scripture, you have eternal life. It's just in a place you don't want to be. It's a different neighborhood. It's totally different. We are created now with a soul that will live forever. And you want eternal life with Christ and all of the incredible things that comes with this. And today we're going to talk about something that we all face, me, you, People you love, every one of us will one day step out into eternity. And we don't like to talk about it because it's a little spooky. It seems kind of unknown. And for those who don't know the Lord and don't have any assurance, it can be a very creepy topic to look at. So today we're going to look at it with truth, and we're going to look at it in love. And I hope that by the end of today, you will be inspired to continue to live a life that follows Christ, to be all in, like we just had on our shirts. When we did those baptisms, I hope that inspired you as much as it did me. I almost just want to say amen and go to eat lunch and have an invitation because it's so, I mean, that's it. I am all in, and I don't care who knows it. And this story today is so profound. So let's dive in. Open your Bibles to Luke 16, or if you're pulling up your favorite Bible app, I'm going to read from the NLT translation. So pull your drop-down menu and pick NLT, and if you're following online or you're home or you're sick today, we're praying for you. Hope God's Word will speak to you loud and clear. I'm going to read from the NLT Luke chapter 6, 16, beginning in verse 19. And it says this, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. <laughs> Get that mental picture. Verse 22. Finally, the poor man died, and he was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, do you remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted? And Lazarus had nothing. So now he is being comforted. And you are the one in anguish. And besides that, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here. And no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers. I want them to be warned so that they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. And the rich man replied, no, 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 Father Abraham, you don't understand. If, if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they'll repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. It's almost like it's foreshadowing. Do you know someone who rose from the dead? And maybe you know someone who rejects that, that doesn't grasp it. It is amazing how this is so applicable to our lives today. It's such a powerful, gripping story. And it's told in just two brief scenes today. Scene one is on earth, and scene two is in the afterlife. In scene one, we meet the first of two of these main categories, uh, characters in this story. We meet the rich man, and then we get to meet Lazarus. And we know this story is primarily directed at the rich man first because Jesus says that in the opening verse. He says, there was a certain rich man. And then he goes on to tell us how lavishly he lived, how he dressed, how he ate sumptuously, and how he had everything he could ever want, and how he lived like a king every day. And unlike the rich man that we studied in the last two stories we, we read about, this rich man is not a hero. 
He's not the hero of the story. He's not the good guy. He is a calloused old guy who thinks about very few people except himself. And we know this because the way he treats the second character in the story, Lazarus, a guy who is dropped off, dumped at his front gate every day. Now, let me clear up any confusion. This is not the same Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead, okay? This is a common name back then. Two different Lazarus, okay? This is Lazarus the beggar. And Lazarus the beggar, his name literally means he whom God helps, which when you look at his condition, covered with sores and hungry and just wasting away, it almost seems ironic that that's his name, but make no mistake, he is absolutely dependent on God. And he knows it. I love the way he lives. He's in such bad physical condition. He's got sores over his legs. Dogs are coming and licking them. He probably has some disease. And day after day, his friends come, dump him at the gate, and he's ignored and allowed to suffer without so much as a crumb of bread or a prayer from the people who go by. And yet, he still praises God. And he still knows him. He says, I am longing to eat the scraps that fall from the tables. That, that alone would satisfy me. What, a, what an image. See, when we think of feast and we think of banquet, I don't know about you, but this is what I picture. I picture this grand hall with a rich mahogany table with leather-bound books all around and tapestries and chandeliers and all these fine things. But that is not the image in first century Palestine. When they're hearing this, they have a far different thing. See, back in Jesus' time, everyone in the audience knew that they were talking about, they would literally open up the doors to the house. There was no air conditioning. They didn't have to worry about that. And you could see this low, long table going through the parlor. And everybody would come who was invited, and they would recline at the table with no chairs. They would lay on their left elbow, and they would have their feet going out at an angle behind them, and they could dip from the table and eat, and they would laugh and, and celebrate. And here's the deal. They would be lined up around this table in order of rank. How obnoxious is that? In order of rank, so you knew whoever was at the head of the table was the big dog. And whoever was right next to him was the second big dog. And then on and on and on. And then if you maybe were at the end of the table, well, bless your heart, at least you got an invitation. Then the servants would stand behind them and would attend to the, do you need some, oh, let me dab the corners of your mouth. And do you need some more to top off and all this. Then if there was still room, they would invite peasants, the commoners, to come in and they would line the walls behind them, behind the servants, behind those who were feasting, and stare and drool. <laughs> and say, what's the, what's the entertainment after this? And if you were lucky enough to get an invitation, you could come in as a peasant and just kind of participate and rub elbows with the hobnobbery and the, and the, the well-to-do. Lazarus doesn't even get that. He doesn't even get a, a, an invitation to come in at the very least. And the fact that Jesus calls him a beggar is very interesting. If you study all of Jesus' parables, you're going to notice something. This is the only one where Jesus actually gives the beggar a name. He actually calls him a proper noun in here. The only time in all the section that we've looked at, and for this reason, and the fact that Luke never says this is a parable, there are some great scholars who have said, Jesus quite possibly is telling a real story about two real people. Church, if, if, if that's the case, then this goes to a whole new level. This is chilling with what we're about to study. These are two real people. So in scene one, it ends with Lazarus dying. He's being carried to heaven, and the rich man dying, and he goes to Hades. Your Bible may say hell, but I don't want to get us confused with the lake of fire that comes in Revelation 20, where death and Hades and sin are thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever, okay? So a more proper rendering would be Hades, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. If your Bible has either one, Hades or, or, or hell, you'll know what we're talking about. So he goes there, and then it says that he was carried to heaven by angels. And this isn't the only time that this is referenced. I think we gloss over this. I think we're so scared of death because we're like, what's going to happen? What do I do? Angels attended him. Even with Elijah, when Elijah died, chariots of fire showed up and escorted him into the presence of God. We see that Jesus says in Matthew 24, he will send angels with a great sound of the trumpet and they will gather together all his elect from the four winds of the world. So evidently, upon our deaths, angels will play a prominent part. Pastor Paul Enns, he's a respected biblical scholar, wrote this about an experience he had recently. And he was a guy who, who was a full of faith, and he was visiting his brother-in-law who was doing horribly in the hospital. And he showed up, and he was struck with how quickly his brother was deteriorating. And he walked into the room, and he could hear the death rattle 
You know what I'm talking about? If you've ever been with a loved one and you think, oh, no, this isn't good. And they call in the family. Well, Dr. Paul Lenz comes in and he sees that his brother-in-law is dying. And there in the hospital room with his few last breaths, his brother-in-law opened his eyes and smiled and said, who are all these people? And Paul said he couldn't believe what was happening. He said that he described a room filled with unseen glorious figures. And then it dawned on Dr. Paul that he was seeing the reality of God dispatching angels to come escort him home. He was already being able to see beyond the veil that separates us, seeing people who were about to welcome him into heaven. God's angels are like royal escorts in this case that escort the believer either into a grand entrance into the royal courts of heaven or the non-believer into a place of torment, a place that you don't want to go, a place of separation from the Lord that they rejected. Here in this story, Jesus is referring to this similar process when Lazarus is taken up in verse 22. So let me pause and say this. If you're a believer, somebody needs to hear this today, and you know someone who's facing death, and they're a follower of Christ, and they are, they've repented of their sins, and they are born again, and you've seen them through the baptismal waters, and these, all these things that confirm that Jesus is Lord of their life. If you are a believer and follower of Christ, you have nothing to worry about about that transition. Nothing at all. Take heart in that. Jesus has paved the way. There are angels. You won't get lost. You won't be wandering around in the ether. They will escort you, and you won't go alone. There will be no one. You won't make the trip by yourself. Dr. Enns puts it this way. He says, the very moment earth's door closes and heaven's door opens, at that very moment, there will be an excited, joyful, and exuberant reunion. But for those who've rejected Christ, it's not that way. It's a very sobering topic because nobody wants to talk about it, but people refuse to preach the whole counsel of the gospel, the whole story. In the afterlife, God grants the wish of both of these. The one who rejected Christ, the one who flat out pushed him away. See, in heaven, he is everywhere present. He is all there, and he is able to be found and seen, and he is able to be touched and felt. But when you're separated from the king, it is awful. So this place takes place, two scenes. The next one, we move into the afterlife. And this is where we see a different story, a different character emerges. One we know by name, but we really don't grasp much, and that's Abraham. If you don't know much about Abraham, is the man. He is the legend. He is the spiritual father of the Jewish nation. And the angels come, and they deposit Lazarus right at Abraham's side, literally right up next to him. Now notice it's not poor Lazarus anymore. Notice the transformation. There's no mention of his sores, no mention of his pain, and he's not just being dropped off like a sack of potatoes like he was in verse 20. See, back then, his so-called friends came, and the original Greek says he wasn't just dropped. It actually gives us a much stronger intensity, meaning he was thrown down at the gate like with disdain, and his friends just went on their merry way. They might come back and pick him up and take him home, but he's not dumped at Lazarus' side anymore. There's no terrible circumstances. There's no rough life for him. Now he is escorted into eternity at the place of honor beside Abraham. This is such a beautiful picture. Jesus is describing something, and those who are listening, their chins are on the floor right here because this is not a banquet that they're used to. See, in that banquet, Lazarus wasn't even invited in. But at this banquet, guess what? Lazarus has not even been invited. He is the guest of honor. He gets to sit right next to Abraham himself. Abraham, the spiritual head of his people. Now remember, if people sit around the table and they recline in order of rank and Abraham's at the head of the table and this guy is given by Jesus the appointment to sit right beside him. What does that say about the host and how he feels? These people who are listening to this are blown away. They're like, what kind of story is this? Why would a beggar get this seat of prominence? I don't understand that. So here's the, Jesus is saying this guy who in this life rarely got treated well, rarely got the breaks. He didn't get the opportunities, no honors, no recognition. We walked right by him. We didn't help him out. We didn't do any of these things. All throughout his life, he sat in a gutter. And if it was a good day, his friends might prop him up against a rich man's gate. That was his life. That was his life. But now in this next life, look at him. He's sitting beside Abraham. Imagine the difference. Imagine what these people are hearing. They are shocked. So now we've got the picture of Lazarus here at the great banquet. And then in contrast to that, we have the rich man. And where does he wind up? In Hades. This calloused, self-sufficient, prideful man who was unresponsive to God's invitations delivered him to his place of his own choosing. All his life, he's had everything he wanted. All his life, he's had everything given to him. And it's almost like he says, you know what? I don't need anything. I'm good. I'm not going to say I don't like God. I'm not going to say I ignore him, but I'm going to live my life in such a way that I kind of keep him out here at arm's length. 
because I've got wealth. I'm doing good. People know me. People are like, I wear purple. Look at me. I'm rich. And it does him nothing. Think about this. He has flat out rejected the invitation. That's what the rich man's done. The rich man would have never thought of this because he was so wrapped up in his own. Does this sound familiar? So caught up in his own blessings that he never paused to think, what will my eternal destination really be if I continue to live this way? And then I think he's in torment and agony. And this is so amazing. This is where the point of the story begins to take shape. And Jesus' listeners' eyes go wide. Because within seconds of him entering this godless destination, the rich guy admits he's in agony. And within minutes of that, guess what he does? He begins a dialogue with Abraham about trying to fix what's going on here. He sees Abraham in paradise. Look at verse 24. He says, Father Abraham, can you have pity on me? Send Lazarus. Let him dip the tip of his finger and come cool my tongue. I'm in agony in these flames. But there's something strange that happens. As I read this this week, here's something I've always missed. Let me ask you a question. Why doesn't the rich man talk directly to Lazarus? Why doesn't he talk to He knows who he is. He's walked by him. He stepped over him at his gate. Why doesn't he go straight to Lazarus? This is, this is so revealing. He could say, hey, Lazarus, old buddy. <laughs> I, me- I meant to give you some- How you doing? Can you-, can you help me out here, old friend, pal? I- did you get any crumbs from my table? I did- you didn't get that invitation? Oh, yeah, you meant- I meant to have you in on that last banquet. My bad. Hey, while we're here and we're just buddies, just talking, old buddy, old pal, can you help me out? Because it's-, it's awful over here. Notice this. This is, this is so revealing. He doesn't do it, and it's almost as if he still sees himself as superior to Lazarus. It's almost as if he still thinks his social class and his standing and his formerly richness that he doesn't have anymore, almost like it still matters. Does it? <laughs> Not at all. He still thinks of Lazarus as someone to run errands for him. He still orders him around. Look at it. Don't, his own words give him away. Hey, Abraham, send that Lazarus, that poor beggar fellow, would you, to bring me a little cup of water? Chop, chop. Here we go. Come on. Help me out. I'm doing... Where, where, do you see how this reveals his heart? And here's another question. Why does he address Abraham as Father Abraham? There's no record this man's a devout Jew, that he cares about Abraham. Now, it could be a term of respect, but maybe this guy never imagined his afterlife destination was going to be Hades. And I bet there's millions of people who never imagined their afterlife destination is where it is. Think about this. So many people, I think he probably thought, look, I'm basically a good guy. I'm from an affluent family. I've got lots of friends. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't shortchange the, the server at Sizzler. I don't, I don't <laughs> cheat on my taxes. When I take my family to the Jerusalem Mudcats game and it's dollar beer night, I don't even get one beer. I'm a, I'm a good guy, basically. So surely that's going to be good enough to, to get me into heaven. But just in case, just in case it's not, look what he does. If his social status and his nice guyness doesn't get him in, he says, I'm a descendant of Abraham. So I will ride his coattail. I'm going to get in based on my lineage, based on who I'm related to. Let me tell you, it doesn't work that way, like at all. Let me show you what being related to somebody will get you. Y'all know that I'm related to the great Leroy Jordan at Alabama football. And here's, here's, here's one of his trading cards, and he went on to play for Bear Bryant and win a championship. And we were so excited when Amy's little brother, Trey, recently came up, and he said, I'm going to the University of Alabama. And we're going to go, oh, that's awesome. You're going to a great school. Our whole family went there, his whole family, all his lineage. And we were so excited. I said, Trey, you don't know this, but you need to go and drop the name of Leroy Jordan when you show up. And watch what happens. Because this guy is an absolute legend. He played for Bear. Then he got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. And here he is sacking Franco Harris. He went to play in the Super Bowl like we're going to see tonight. He played in three of them. And then he went on to have his picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Beef played 14 years. Go to five All-Pro Bowls. Two-time All-Pro. Played in five NFC Championship games. Landed on the cover. And then when he retired, they put his name and his number up on the ring of honor between Tom Landry and Roger Staubach, all because of his playing at Alabama. His hands are in the cement when you walk into Alabama Stadium in front of Denny Chimes. He is a legend. He's all over the Hall of Fame. So you go, you will never have to buy a hamburger in Tuscaloosa. If you go in and say, I'm the nephew of the great Leroy Jordan, I said, you go drop that name and you tell him I sent you, okay? Because you're, you're, you're a celebrity. He's in the booth. He's on ESPN. Just, you, you'll run into him. You'll see him. Trey couldn't wait. 
He's walking into a fancy restaurant not long after he arrives in Tuscaloosa, and he sees this huge crowd of people, and there's Joe Namath and, and Bart Starr, and, and I mean, all these celebrities are around, and, and ESPN Game Day's there, and Kirk Herbstreit, all these people, and he sees in this restaurant this cluster of people, and as, the, as he gets closer, he sees right in the middle of this curved booth of people is Leroy Jordan. His new uncle, by marriage, through me, because Amy was kind enough to marry me. So he walks up and he goes, is that who his friend's like, dude, you got to go talk to him. That's your great uncle. So he walks up in front of everybody. Remember, he's thinking he's related to this guy. And he says, you're Leroy Jordan. He says, yeah. He says, I'm related to you. (laughs) Leroy said, I can't say what he said, but he said, basically, I doubt that in his words. And he said, I don't think so. Who are you? And he goes, well, I'm Trey Sanders. <laughs> do, do, uh, do you know who Terry Mitchell is? And he goes, who? Who's that? And he goes, oh, what? but that's my, uh, hmm. And he just, he just kind of slinked away, and it was absolutely humiliating. Come to find out, Trey came and told me that story. I said, oh, my goodness, Trey. In the family tree, you totally forked the wrong way. He, he doesn't know my dad. He doesn't know the Mitchells from Adam. No wonder he thought you were just one of another. I'm related to you. How about some money? You got to go through my mom's side, through the Friels and the Jordans, the Leroy Jordan. I said, no wonder they laughed at you. He got nothing out of being related to him. And I think as I look at this, he found out being disrelated means nothing, just like this man is disrelated to Father Abraham. It means nothing, even though he says, hey, maybe you could fix this, Father Abraham. And how does Abraham reply? Look at the scripture. He says, I can't. There is a great gulf between us, an immovable chasm. Besides, you have 50, 60, 70 years to make your decision. And this rich man, excuse me, formerly rich man, is standing there, and it's starting to dawn. He's starting to think, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? And that's where the climax takes place. Y'all remember the Grinch? When the Grinch has this horrible revelation, and he finally looks at the girl, and he's like he's seeing the value of a person for the very first time. And you remember his heart grew? It was like... Six sizes too small, and it kept growing and growing and growing, and then he just lit up because he finally got it. This is what happens right here to the formerly rich guy. Look at verse 28. He says, okay, fine. Then I beg you, Father Abraham, go send Lazarus to my house. Here's another order. For I have five brothers. Let them warn them. They don't need to come to this place of torment. Let me ask you this. How long has this guy been in hell at this moment? Maybe, maybe five minutes, right? And suddenly he's asking for the salvation of the people he loves? Think about what's just happened here. Think about this reversal. Just five minutes in hell is enough to turn this selfish, self-made, self-focused, self-sufficient rich guy into a a wholehearted evangelist. Like that. What has happened? So here's what we can observe so far in the story. According to Jesus, our location in eternity is not based on our social standing, and it's not based on our lineage. It's based on accepting his invitation and his grace. That jumps off the page. This is a huge deal. See, unlike the shrewd manager from last week who bet everything on the reputation of the master, this rich guy bet everything on himself. He bet the farm and he lost. And what he didn't know was that Paul would come along just a little bit later and tell everyone, everywhere he went, guys, it is through Christ that we are saved. It's not because of anything righteous we've done. It's not our social standing. It's not our heritage. It's not our ethnicity. It's not any of that. It's because of him and his mercy alone, having been justified by his grace, his grace, his willingness to grant forgiveness to anyone who is honest enough to admit we're flawed, that we need a savior. I'm sure that was a lot easier for Lazarus to do. He was used to humbling himself. He was used to crying out for forgiveness. He depended on God, but not this rich guy, this rich guy. So instead of getting into heaven, he gets a seat in Hades and it is awful. It is incredible what happens to Lazarus. We see that not only does he get entrance into heaven, he gets forgiven, but he gets one of the best seats at the banquet. So the second thing we shouldn't miss in both of these neighborhoods is the permanency of it. We can't cross over. You can't cross over. There's a huge gulf between us. If you're taking notes, number two is this. According to Jesus, our location in eternity is permanent. Don't think it isn't. Once we've crossed over, it's done. It's final. There's no returns, no exchanges, no refunds, no rain dates. Only the living can repent. Only the living can ask for grace. That's why prophet after prophet says, seek the Lord now while he may be found. Seek him. Call on him while he's near. Because if you don't, when he's not near, he can, you choose to push him away, he will grant you what you ask for. And he will be far away forever. 
2 Corinthians 6 says, I tell you, now, today is the time of God's favor. Now is the day for salvation. When this life passes, we get to live forever with the consequences of our choice. That's powerful. We don't hear that enough. And the third observation is the one we just talked about. Five minutes in hell turns a hard, hardened non-believer into an instant evangelist. What a powerful... Think about that. We have to admit an inescapable truth here. Hell is a real place, and real people go there according to Jesus. The same one who told us about heaven that we readily accept talked even more about hell than he did about heaven. Yet we dismiss it, and we don't tell our friends, and we don't tell our neighbors, and we don't come down here and pray for people by name, laying them before the Father, saying, this is a horrible place. You don't want to go there. And here's the reality of it. It says in other places, it is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do we know what gnashing of teeth is from? Do we really grasp what that means? It is horrific. We don't even grasp the agony and the torment that leads to that. Not to mention the constant gnawing regret that you would have saying, why did I not listen? Why was I so stubborn? Why did I live life holding God at arm's length? Why? This is a blip on the radar compared to eternity. And what's Abraham's response to all this? He says, oh, you, you have been told. You have been told. You know the truth. They have Moses. They have the prophets. That's basically the entire Old Testament. Moses wrote the first five books of the Pentateuch, and then the prophets wrote the majority of the rest. He says, you have all of the Jewish Old Testament. You've been around people all day long. You've listened to Christian radio. You've seen Christian movies. You've come up against Christians. Man, I hope you have. And you have seen these things. This is, this is an indictment on us. He says, you, you have been told. And he goes, I love how he still argues. He says, no, 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 Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes and tells them, then they'll repent. And Abraham's like, they, they won't do it then. Not even if someone rises from the dead. Do you know somebody like that? Jesus rose from the dead. We have the, we're on this side of the resurrection. And there are people who still don't grasp it. Hell is real and it is terrible, but there is grace. And it is available to the least attractive of beggars. Anyone who will welcome the invitation to express repentance and accept his forgiveness gets to sit with the likes of Abraham. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to have our musicians quietly come up. And as we get ready to, to go into a time of prayer, I want you to start thinking of one person that's lost in your family, one person that's lost in your circle of friends, that you want to lay their name before the Father. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Jesus is telling us a very clear message here. Don't miss this. He is saying the same message today as he did back then. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't think your pedigree and your own merits and your descendancy is going to get you anywhere. Because... Before the throne, it's just us. It's just us. We stand before him. And if we trust in him, it's Jesus is saying the same thing. I'm going to rise from the dead, and I'm going to take your sin. It's going to be substituting my life for yours. That's substitutionary atonement. It's a fancy word for saying, I will take your burden. I will take your sin, but you have to accept this. You have to repent of sin. You have to trust in me and trust in my grace. And as disciples, he's telling us today, you are the ones to tell them. It's us. They're not going to hear it on CNN or Fox News. They're not going to hear about it reading the New York Times. They're only going to hear about it if they read God's word or they run into you. That's it. We are the ambassadors. This is it. They are going to need someone like you to give them Moses and the prophets. When I lived in Washington, D.C., the subway and the metro was not something you enjoyed riding. And not long ago in Washington, D.C., a poorly dressed violinist showed up. And he started to play his heart out. But not one person stopped. Not one person stopped and heard, this guy's great. There he was, clearly a beggar, dressed in just casual clothes, playing song after song. He played on and on as busy people just walked right on by, paying virtually no attention to him whatsoever. After almost a solid hour of playing his heart out, even breaking a sweat, thousands of people walking by him, only six people stopped and bothered to listen to his amazing, beautiful songs. Only six people. After he'd finished playing his heart out, for anyone who would listen, he quietly packed up his violin and he disappeared into the night. Now what people didn't realize was that this person 
was actually the famous, world-renowned violinist Joshua Bell. And what they further didn't realize was this man stood just inches away from them playing his three million dollar Stradivarius. This is the man, the same virtuoso who just two nights before had sold out the Boston Theater where people had lined up to buy tickets to hear him with ticket prices starting at $105 each at the nosebleed sections. And he stood right there. Though he played a $3 million Stradivarius and he sold out this Boston Theater and everywhere he goes, packed out, only six people bothered to listen to his message through song. Six. What a powerful story to illustrate. We should never neglect the opportunity that's in front of us. We should never neglect the, what is standing right here, that God is presenting this invitation. Today, love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus is being extended to you. It's being extended to me. It's being extended to you listening at home. All we have to do is be willing to admit we need it. You know why? Because we're just one beggar telling another beggar, well, we found food and we need it. People are starving. So who's on your heart right now? Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes just for this moment. Allow the Lord to lay somebody on your heart and then you lay that right before the Father. Father, we cry out for those who need to know you. Lord, if there's somebody in the sound of my voice, whether it's way at home or traveling in a car or listening here in this room, God, I pray that you would break through any barrier, any wall that we've built. God, help us. Bring us to the place where so many of us have once confessed, Lord, but if there's somebody listening that hasn't, may they confess now, you are Lord. You are who you say you are. Only you rose from the dead and did what you said you did. God, we confess our sin to you. We know we've blown it in big ways and small ways. It doesn't matter to you because my unrighteousness has separated us from a holy God. God, I thank you that you were the substitutionary death on the cross, so I couldn't die. I wasn't perfect anyway. Lord, you did. You were the blameless sacrifice, and all of our sin and iniquity was hurled on you. God, I pray that that person that's listening now would accept that substitution. Lord, help us to repent of our sin, to not be content to play footsies with the world or to flirt with material things, thinking that will secure our future, but to be sold out, to be all in. Help us, Lord. Forgive us. Help us to be about your business. Help us to share the law of Moses and, and the prophets and the, the good news of the gospel. So, Father, for that person that's on our mind, that's on our hearts right now, Lord, we lay them before your throne. Will you give us an opportunity to speak to them about you. Open that door. Provide that divine appointment. Lord, if it's a stranger we haven't even met, so be it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to rub elbows with somebody and you would open that door and you would give us boldness. Lord, you can use a weak message. You can use a botched message, but you can't use no message. So God, help us to be messengers, to be willing to speak for you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.